grandpa probably never asked my mom about emotions ever, not once. Right. And so we're like, we need to ask all the time. We need to know where they're at emotionally. And these kids are like, it's too much. Hey everyone, I'm Morgan, co-founder of Primal Kitchen and host of the Primal Kitchen podcast. Today, I'm super excited to be sitting down with child whisperer, Dr. Siggy Cohen, who prefers to go by Siggy. So I will give her the full doctor credit in the intro and I'm gonna call her Siggy for the rest of the episode. Uh, For more than 35 years, she has worked extensively with thousands of children and families. Known for her unparalleled depth of insight when it comes to working with children, she has her own private practice and has developed an immense following on both Instagram and TikTok with easy to follow videos filled with parenting tips and practical solutions to help both parents and children live a primal life. Today, we'll be talking about balancing screen time, the overall positive parenting approach to help raise a good human and not lose our minds as parents in the process. Before we get into it, a brief reminder that any and all opinions and views shared by hosts and guests on this podcast are the speaker's own and do not represent the view of Primal Kitchen or its affiliates or parent company. Hello, Siggy, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, Morgan. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited. This is a topic very near and dear to my heart. I have two boys with a third on the way, so I am just... I think a lot of this stuff we end up talking about as adults really starts here. So it's very cool to be learning just about optimizing kind of life and development from the very, very beginning. So give us the background. How did you get into um, child development? Like what was your background and where did, how did you end up narrowing in on this field? It's a good question. And um, the answer changes often because life continues to change. And I feel like I'm constantly morphing into the next thing and the next thing. But what is consistent is that I was always a a caretaker, a typical caretaker, you know, the little girl that collects dolls, street dogs, and other people's children. Um, And I just enjoyed it. So being around children, Uh, was always very comfortable for me. I did start as a preschool teacher. I always thought that's just a job that I do because it's easy for me. But then I realized, oh no, that's a job that I do because I love it and I enjoy being around children. Um, Through that, I continued my my education and um, thought that I would stay as a teacher. But then it kind of um, morphed into what it is today um, with some twists and turns, but always in the same kind of direction of being around children, working with families, um, putting myself in the center of people's lives um, in the most difficult situations that they go through and helping them navigate, finding a sense of peace, a sense of calm, a sense of uh, collaboration between all the family members, whatever the journey is. I love it. And where did you grow up? Did you grow up in, you're in- I Southern grew up in Israel. Oh, in Israel. Okay, cool. Right. But I came here, I've been in the United States um, for many years. So my- uh, My children were born here and I raised them here in California and my education is almost all here except for some of what I brought because I started really young working with children Um, just because I, you know, because I thought it was an easy thing for me to do until I realized that is just what I love doing. Yeah, that's just your calling. I love it. Um, Do you, you have kids of your own? I have three boys and they're all grown now. Um, so I can relate to you yes. raising what's it like what does it mean to raise boys yeah um, and as a woman and in today's world right yeah yeah, yeah tell us so, well, while we're there you got to tell me a little bit more about that yes <laughs> yeah so my boys are wonderful they're great they're great people um you know and that's what I'm proud of they, yeah they they're stable and they are communicative and they have their own journeys of life like everyone else but I can see that there is a solid infrastructure which is what I like to help parents it's not creating any perfection by any means because that doesn't exist but it is taking what we have who we are even what our family is and our life and what life brings us and pulling it all together to really make the best of it Yeah. 
I love that. So what do you think contributed to like, you know, the success, I guess, in your own family? Like what things did you pull in from your learnings that were impactful in raising your kids? It's a very good question. And I think that the main answer is maybe awareness. I think that I was always aware of my separate emotions from everyone else's. And I was able to really uh, bank on that in a way to constantly have this ability to recognize how things trigger me, how it is that, um, especially children, how they get under your skin, what is going on with them that makes you feel, react, um, triggers obviously a lot of your own needs, weaknesses, um, then unmet needs and so on. I was able to compartmentalize that, to kind of recognize where I begin and end and where they begin and end. And I think that is what often I bring into um, helping other people, sort of like pause, stop, recognize what is going on before you jump in to yeah. react emotionally, irrationally, yeah. um, because that's not usually the right gauge or the right tool. Yeah, that's very interesting. I definitely can find myself, I, I am aware that, that it can be an issue, but I definitely can find myself doing things like that. I think a lot of parents are, with, especially with toddlers, but I, I can't imagine it really gets that much easier. Um, but it is such a learning experience about your own self, isn't it? Like, do yes. you find that a lot with your clients? You end up talking more about kind of like, not so much tools for the kids, but like, hey, let's hone in on why you're reacting that way. Like, what are the common, what do you see in your practice? Like, do you feel like you have a specialty and what are some of those like common themes you see where, you know, that awareness is maybe lacking? I think, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, misunderstanding is what I see a lot. Parents misunderstand their children and where their children are coming from. So they see reactions, they see behaviors, they respond to this, <clears throat> Sorry, they respond to these behaviors and they're not recognizing what triggers these behaviors. What else is going on? It's almost like sometimes I think there's like a headliner and we don't read the rest of the story. We just make an assumption based on those few words <clears throat> put together. Yeah. So what I am doing, what I say is let's look at the rest of the story. And you're absolutely right that the rest of the story has so much to do with the parents, not just the children. I'm not saying it's all the parents. It's not all just parenting. Children bring their own personality, their own wiring, their own um, abilities and inabilities. They bring their own understanding and misunderstanding. Children are their own people in so many ways, but they don't live in a bubble. They are connected to the people around them. And therefore what we need is to first understand who the child is in order to know what is the right response to them rather than just whatever it is that I think needs to happen right now, sort of like the one size fits all. This is what needs to happen and let's just, get that done. A lot of times it's what is really the child trying to say? What is the child um what is the child trying to be that we misunderstand and we're trying for them to be something else. And therefore they're resistant. Um, they confront us, they push back, and it creates friction between parents and children. Yeah, definitely. And are you working with kids of all ages, parents of all ages, all, all the things, or do you have like an age that you work with the most? I work with kids of all ages. Um, and usually, you know, back to the other question. Yeah, parents bring their children because there are small issues, big issues. So anywhere from typical day to day, don't want to get up, don't want to get ready for school. There's a lot of screaming, yelling. Um, you can't get the child to do anything. They don't even want to sit in the car seat and so on and so forth. Two, obviously, other issues, maybe at school, maybe aggression, maybe sibling rivalry that goes out of control. And as they get older, social issues of children at school, um, the way children perceive what exactly is going on around them and how they 
um, understand or misunderstand it and therefore how they react to it with anxieties and stress. So a lot of times it's understanding the family dynamic that makes me help the parents more than just therapizing the children directly. So you want me to fix the child, but it really is about a collaborative work that we all have to do together, not to fix ourselves, but to recognize who we are, to be aware of what we bring into this family dynamic and how to make that work much better with awareness and mindfulness. Yeah, I love it. Um, how, how important is like place in the family? Do you think like youngest, oldest, middle, two siblings, five siblings, like, where do you see that like playing out? I'm so curious. Yeah, it plays a role. It's not the only thing that plays a role, but it definitely plays a role. Um, you know, I sometimes, I mean, I used to say about my middle child that he was a middle child before he had a younger sibling. So before he was even a middle child, he already had the characteristic of that. And what are those characteristics for those listening who might not know? Like the, right. A little bit more, uh, pushbacks, a little bit more, um, neediness, um, feeling like they are not as seen and heard as maybe the older child who got all the attention Uh, and didn't have to share it for a while and so on. Yeah. Um, So a place in the family is important. Gender plays a role. Um, The gender of the parent, right? So a boy and and a father and a boy and a mother not necessarily the same thing. And so how do you see that play out? Like what are, what, what are some common themes? Let's see. So um, for instance, uh, as a mom of, of boys, um, as women, we tend to talk a little too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I suffer from that, like more than the average woman, I would say. Right. So for instance, a male brain, you know, we, we often laugh about it. They kind of shut down. They, I got you, you know, um, I got you the first time you said it, you don't have to say it over and over again and so on and so forth. It is actually really true. Their communication style is very different. So as a mother to boys, I have to maybe adjust that, not think that I have to say the same thing over and over again. Nothing that I have to lecture so much with so many words and then be frustrated and disappointed that my son is not listening to me. Yeah. So something so simple as that. Um, it's, you know, boys can be very factual, can be more. And again, this is generalization. Yeah, I'm not, this yeah. is not, you know, stereotyping boys but it's more understanding nature and nature has a big role in this. The fact that the genders are slightly different. Yeah. Yeah. What about daughters? Like girls and dads or girls and moms, like how does that communication difference? Sure. It plays a role as well. Right. Um, you know, we can be specific and we can see what is the girl needing from her dad? Is she looking to um, is she looking to be protected? Is she looking to be rescued? Is dad falling into that role of rescuing his daughter, protecting her, worrying about her because he's a male and he knows how other males think and he's already thinking how maybe people will take advantage of her and so on. So I have to be aware of that if I am the dad and this is my daughter to kind of sometimes replay that. I have to revisit that. I can't just jump into conclusions and assumptions because that is my sort of like general experience. Right. Kind of see it for what it is. Is my daughter really needing rescuing or me to protect her? Is this what I want her to see in male, in a male figure? Um, Yeah. Maybe not always, right? I don't necessarily want her to think that this is what she needs to be, you know, rescued. Much like I don't want my son maybe to feel like they always have to be strong and tough and right. It's kind of like that. And maybe it's easier for a girl to speak about her emotions, but it doesn't mean that boys cannot do that. Yeah, they need to. I mean, we all need to do it. Otherwise, it's 
it gets ugly later in life. I feel like if you're holding it all in all the time. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like you, a responsibility when I was raising my boys to raise a good man, right? Yeah. That can see the other, that can be inclusive, not just of other males, but of females as well and recognize differences and recognize how we're not always the same. And that's okay. We don't have to be the same. We just have to be able to recognize it, to hear, to listen, to look further. Yeah. And you've been practicing for how long? So overall, it's um, I'm in the field of child development in education and psychology for over 35 years, maybe right. even more. I start yeah. counting at some point. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and how have things changed? Like, have things changed over time? Are you still seeing the same parenting issues? Or is things, are things radically different? Like, what's your take on this world we're living in these days and how that differs from maybe when, you know, your, your boys were little or, yeah. I think that things have definitely changed. Um, and not all for the, you know, we tend to say, oh, things are worse or things are better. Things have changed. Some are good, some are not as much. I think that there is a lot more focus on children's emotions on a regular basis yeah. and continuously as if that is the only thing that plays a role in our life. Yeah. So emotions in our emotional world and emotional development and language are crucial, but they are one part of who we are. We can't just focus on that. And sometimes that over-focusing on emotions constantly asking children how they feel, what they like, what they don't like, uh, what do they want, um, as if they can make these decisions constantly, as if they can actually carry that burden of responding and answering to questions. Um, I think that has gone a little too much. Oh, and we're expressing our children. We've overcorrected. We've overcorrected. Yes. My grandpa probably never asked my mom about emotions ever, not once. Right. So we're like, we need to ask all the time. We need to know where they're at emotionally. And these kids are like, it's too much. Leave me it's alone. Too much. Yes. I think yeah. it's important, but we have to know when so much is way, way too much. Yeah. And pull back. So I think that that creates a lot of stress, anxiety in children, way more anxiety than we've seen before. Interesting. It puts children in a place where they're constantly consumed by their own emotions and therefore they can't actually regulate because you can't do that you can't just be in your emotions all the time and find a balance and especially not when you are little and don't yeah. have experience so being driven by just the emotional development um, of each individual in the family and the family as a whole how are we constantly feeling takes away, I think, from some functionality, which is what we see, I think, more today. Interesting. A little more chaos. Yeah. <laughs> what else? What Are there any other things that have rebounded, kind of, or the pendulum swinging the other way, or what do you, you see in any other interesting trends? I, I think children are overwhelmed by... Um, in, a, in a way, by giving in to what it is that they want as opposed to guiding and leading them um, to what it is that they need more than just what they want. So it used to be, do as I say, it doesn't matter how you feel, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't ask you, you know, how was school and yeah. what do you like? And it's like, yeah, this is what we need to do to- yeah, You're gonna get oh, this degree. It's practical to be a nurse, like moving along. Yeah, no questions. Right, exactly. So I think this- over accommodation has taken away some very crucial tools and skills that we need in order to navigate life. Coping skills, resilience, problem solving skills. As humans, we are capable of figuring things out on our own. We have a cumulative experience that we take in, that we process, that we can use and the, that turns into our coping skills, our resilience, sort of like our, the strength of our muscles. If we don't work them, they don't work for us. 
and the fact that everything is done for them. So they don't need to actually take part in figuring things out, small problems, bigger problems. We do it all for them. We are making them less um, ready for life, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel that's the biggest danger today. Interesting. So how do you combat some of that? Like, aside from just, I mean, practically, like, how does it play out where you take a back seat? Like, what does that look like, I guess? Remember that children have intelligence, first of all. Remember that they are actually thinkers um, that you can make them aware past their own emotions. So it's not reacting to how they feel. It's making them aware of how they feel. This is why I do a lot of the narration, the validation. I witness how my child feel as opposed to question, to doubt, to try and figure out, okay, fine. So you're not here. Let's do this. Let's do that. It's like, I see how you feel. I'm a witness because my child needs to recognize I'm not so helpless. Right. I'm not completely incapable and everything has to be done for me. Yeah. So I raise the bar on their natural ability so they can actually recognize, oh, I can do this. In real life, it means including the children in finding solutions, um, helping them find ways to think about something. Even if the solution, the fix is not immediate, which is another problem that I think we see today, the quick fixes to everything. Yeah. Right. We're used to the click. It's one click away and we get it. No patience for anything. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. People are freaking out like, oh, the Amazon, it takes three days to get stuff now. It's like we got so used to this. (laughs) And these companies are like, we can't keep up. Like, this is crazy. And then the people are like, wait, we're, we're so sad on these. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we see it. Yeah. Patient, for sure. Right. That And that is a problem. You know, it, it feels like, okay, it's my note. We can't wait for three days for something to arrive. Yes, we can. Yeah. And we need to, and we should, because when we can't, it, we're constantly on edge. We're constantly telling ourselves that something is wrong. And think of how that stresses us. What's yeah. wrong? Why is it not here? Why it's not as opposed to, it's not. Yeah. It's okay. Exactly. We can actually survive we, this. Yeah. And we need to survive this. That is what I'm saying. It's not just that we can, it's not a privilege. It's a need. We absolutely have to kind of step back a little bit and say, I know I can get through this because one time it's, you know, it's not, it's the candy I don't get. It's the Amazon box that doesn't arrive, but it could be other things I have to cope and manage through. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting point on this candy you don't get. So like, how do you handle, like, how do you advise people to handle like stuff like that? Like I've got sugar obsessed toddlers and I'm like, I feel like I'm in the top 10% of like, we don't have that stuff in our house. And my young, my three-year-old is like motivated by ice cream. Like you wouldn't even believe. And, and we don't even, you know, this is like a very special treat. This is not something we're having every day. Like, how do you handle that kind of stuff? Even when they get older. Yeah. 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 So the options are overwhelming and because we have so much of everything, we think that we can't do without it. So what we're dealing with is again, the temptation and the the need to help our children regulate that temptation, like create space and time between I want and I must have it to I want and I can wait for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so conversations about temptation Or what, you know, and with young children, what does it feel like to want something so much? See how I can get in touch with how a child feels. I recognize, I validate, I witness, but I don't fix it. I'm just there with them. It's not what we go through. It's how we go through something alone or with someone's help. 
So don't take the experiences, the difficulties, the challenges away from your child. Just be there when they are being challenged. Yeah. So I can see it's so hard. It's hard. And they're crying and screaming. And notice what it does. You know, we go back to the beginning of the conversation. Notice what it does to you. You feel helpless. You feel defeated. You feel like you have to fix it. You feel it's urgent that you fix it for your child. So now you're feeding into that. I can't wait for that box. And I'm all stressed and anxious mm -hmm. when it doesn't arrive. Yes, I can. And I have to remind myself that over and over. I can, my child can. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite like parenting quotes that I have the hardest time living by is prepare the child for the path, not the path for the child. And I think I see so much now of so many parents like, you know, running around trying to make the path perfect so the kid can just walk on through. But I think what I'm hearing from you is like, actually, the roadblocks along the way are good. Just be there for them. And it's fine that they have to deal with some hardship because I fall into this myself. I'm like, what's the perfect school I can send them to that's going to be like tailored just to like boys education. And they're going to have like ample time to play outside and also learn how to cook a meal and get it, you know, and I mean, it's, it's too much pressure, even as a parent to try and like find this perfect path for them when it, I, I probably don't even need to be worrying about that. Perhaps I need to be worried about something else. Well, that when you worry about that, you are assuming that you can actually control that to the max. Yeah. You can really create a perfect situation where nothing, I don't know, it's goes hard. wrong. Nothing's hard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> nothing is hard, which is an impossibility. And I think we have to recognize that. But the problem with that is that we've heightened our fear and anxiety about what can go wrong as opposed to strengthen our muscles of when something goes wrong, I am strong enough to figure it out, to navigate, yeah. to ask for the right help, to know what to do. I'm not going to break. Yeah. So it's not managing the path in such a way that let's make sure nothing happens. It's actually, yeah, the path is the path. It's fine to be prepared somewhat. But as I'm walking the path, I'm strengthening myself. Each time I stumble, I fall, my muscles get better, even falling and learning to get up, right? Yeah. It's so important. Think about it physically, literally, and metaphorically. So yeah. that's what we want for our children. I'm not abandoning my child, go on the path and whatever happens, happens. I'll be, I'm not, but I'm also not constantly micromanaging the path. Oh, oh don't step here. You're going to fall. Oh, don't do that. You're going to. It's like, I see, yeah, there's a potential fall right there. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I went to camp for eight, like sleepover camp for eight weeks when I was eight. So eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12, I was at like a girl's camp in Northern Wisconsin canoeing. We had chores. We wore uniforms. It was very like, but we had a ton of fun, right? I mean, I, I cried I cried when I arrived at camp and was homesick for 24 hours, but the hardest I cried at camp was like the last day of camp when he had to leave. Right. I loved it. But you know, I was eight. Like, I think now, man, like I have a three-year-old, like my, my parents both grew up going to camp in the woods in Northern Wisconsin too. But I mean, we were canoeing, you know, it was hard. It was adventurous. And I often think about, I don't know, just kind of like experiences like that, that, you know, are probably pretty impactful in just building confidence and other things. I think there's just some cool things you can do, but, but that's extreme. Like I tell people I went to camp for eight weeks at eight years old and they're like, what are your parents like crazy? You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And actually they did that because they believed that that is going to build the skills that you're going to need later on, yeah. whether they were aware of it or it was just there in the back of their mind, subconsciously, somehow they felt that this is the right thing. So again, I'm not saying that you have to do that and everybody needs to send their kids to, um, Take, you know, whatever, sleep. Yeah. right. But what I'm saying is we want to be aware that our children absolutely need coping skills. So don't make the path perfect for them and constantly bubble wrap their life in such a way that they're not capable. Yeah. And they're not using and utilizing the natural skills they have because helplessness results in anxiety. 
Yeah. The more I feel helpless, I can't do it, the more anxious I become. So we want to have tools and skills. Maybe I can't figure everything out, but I have a basic trust that I will, that I can, get through it. Yeah. that I will get through it. So important nowadays, I think. Yeah, for sure. Something I see too, I feel like, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's a few documentaries on it, just like kind of the epidemic of men now, it was a little bit, I'm 38. So maybe it's people who are 30 and younger boys, like growing up in the world and just not having confidence, like Peter Pan, failure to launch, you know, no motivation, just not really engaged in life, still at home. Like, do you feel like that is a trend that's on the rise or, and is there anything you attribute that to? And I'm just curious your thoughts on that. I mean, I see that it's very true. And some of it, you know, we, we will have to kind of look into it further, you know, what is the sociology aspect of that? Is this because of economics? Is this because, um, right, um, the way in which the world is now that um, children do, to a certain degree, uh, mature later? Um, and, you know, it used to be 18, out, leave, do your thing, I'll see Go you at home. Christmas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But now it's more like we're there, we're present, we want to stay connected because I think the world is so kind of like, um, you know, it's, it's scary a little more than what people think it was before. And so people want to keep the families together. Um, and so it's kind of like, you don't have to leave, stay, it's okay. Yeah. What I think is that what we need to be aware of is there is one need of me to keep my child to me, <laughs> to myself, right? Like to fix everything for them and to make it all right for them. But also what I need to be aware of, is my child capable of actually knowing to set boundaries to me at some point as well? And that's why from the very beginning, I raised them to recognize what they can do on their own, to be independent. So they can tell me at some point, it's okay, mom, I can do this on my own rather than, I don't know what to do. And immediately I jump in and maybe they say, I don't know what to do. And maybe I jump in and maybe they say, I don't know what to do, but I want to figure it out. Yeah. That's a very different kind of way of being, right? It's not don't be involved in my life. It's what is a, where is the fine line between we are connected to one another, but we don't stay completely codependent on each other to a point where we can't do anything on our own. Yeah. So the parents that, you know, the, I mean, and I know, and I see that the kids that are staying home longer, the men that don't know what to do, sometimes the girls too. Totally. Yeah, the parents are jumping in. I mean, and I see, you know, things such as a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old, my computer broke, dad runs and gets a new computer. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, that's kind of like, I, I want, you know, when they were two and they, I want more candy, I want more ice cream. Okay, fine, I'll give you more. No, not yeah. necessarily. You're 19, so your computer broke. Okay. Now what? What are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do about it? I don't know. Well, think about it. Yeah. But if a parent jumps to right away, go get a new computer, but then the parents complain, my child, you know, is dependent and they're not doing anything on their own. I'm like, do you feed into it as well? <laughs> Yeah. It's what I learn and always in therapy. Like I bring something about my husband to therapy and I learn like, oh, it's actually, it's actually my problem. <laughs> like, this is just what I feel like therapy is being able to look in the mirror and being like, yes, I did create that problem. Didn't I? Okay. Like let's learn and move on. So that, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, okay. This is, I'm going to go on a tangent here, but I want to know your thoughts on this. So I feel like we've moved the first grade curriculum to kindergarten, right? And you've got this massive movement to homeschooling. And I don't know that most kids are ready to learn how to read when we're putting all this pressure on them to read at such a young age. Right. And I feel like you could end up in a scenario where you have 
a first grader who's in a special reading program and they then have like an instilled confidence issue at a young age because of just this rush in our education system. Am I making up this theory when you can tell me if I am, or is this something that you see? Cause this is something I'm very worried about as a mom of young kids. Right. So I can tell you this, that teaching college, by the way, and I taught college child development and college for 20 years, over 20 years, we always taught the developmental way. And then my students went out into the world to become preschool teachers or elementary school teachers. And suddenly they had to abandon the developmental way and do what sort of like the pressure from where parents, um, you know, test scores, test funding, scores, school right? boards, yeah, school boards, and so on. So, what is this gap? What does it mean, and why is it there? So, there is wrong pressure on children to jump ahead in their development to do what they're not actually supposed to be doing, but there is a higher price to that. One. We, uh, we sort of like burn them out so much faster and sooner because, you know, they have many more years to learn. Yeah. And the other thing is we're missing out on natural, organic, developmental stages that are there to actually help children learn independently. So we, you know, as you say, the curriculum of first grade is now kindergarten. It's actually the curriculum of first grade is pre-K. It's oh, wow. even a year younger. Um, you know, I see, and I know, and we've seen that before, right? Parents with flashcards in front of infants, you know, and proud that their toddler can identify two from seven and A from Z. But when you think about it, so your toddler maybe can identify uh, symbols. Can they put them together to really understand the pattern of reading and writing? Not really. Or the mathematical concept of two, because I recognize the number two doesn't mean I understand the mathematical concept of one, two. It's yeah. not the same thing. What it is is that we are rushing and we're missing out on what they need to be able to absorb on their own. Because our children can absorb so much information. Understanding a dog from a cat, a tree from a flower, a big car, a truck from a train. I mean, that's just like recognizing two from five. Yeah. But does it mean that I can drive a train or a car? Does it mean that I can grow a plant on my own? No, I need way more information. Yeah. So we want to, I do believe, slow down in. But how do you do that within the confines of the education system today? I mean, seriously. It's, uh, it's one of my personal struggles, to tell you the truth. Yeah. And I wrote my uh, doctoral dissertation on that. Really? So it, I didn't know yeah. that. Um, the fact that preschools succumb to the pressure of parents. When is my child going to know colors and numbers? And when are they going to read? And they have to be ready for kindergarten. That's a very misleading statement. They have to be ready for kindergarten. There's no yeah. such thing. No. <laughs> they're ready for kindergarten when they're five, five and a half, six. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah, because they're ready because it, learning is a process. It's not like a destination that needs to be achieved at some date on the calendar once a year. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I can tell you that studies show, um, and we compare to other countries such as Norway, Sweden, Germany, even England, that you can teach a child to read for three years when they're not ready. So you can start at three and at six, maybe after drilling them time and time, they're gonna learn how to read. But you can take a six-year-old and in three weeks, teach them how to read because they're ready. Yeah. So why did we waste so much time? What exactly did it do? It didn't create a better reader. It actually filled up the brain with um, unuseful information while they actually needed to sort, to categorize, to count, to absorb colors, numbers, shapes from the world around them and manipulate it through play and recognize physics and chemistry because they're mixing stuff because they're building things that fall down yeah. because they're touching different textures 
that's how they needed to build infrastructure to step into first grade, sit there and learn how to read and write because their brain is ready. ready so yeah. that pressure results in, I can tell you, here's a, a major change. I remember years ago when I would talk to children, they would love school kindergartners loved school, first graders, second graders, by third grade, they would start saying, you know, I would say, do you like school? No, I hate school. Now kindergartners say I hate school. What does that mean? Yeah. It means, yeah, that's the burnout. We are pumping them with useful, uh, useless information, stress and pressure that is really not needed. And they have so many more years to be in an environment that should open them up and intrigue and stimulate. And instead it turns them off to learning. Yeah, no, I could see that. Yeah, that's brutal. I, I like really, I found a few schools. There's some cool ones for those who live in the Midwest. There's a Upland Hill school in um, right outside Oxford, Michigan. And they, it's outdoor and they, the teachers there are like, we want them to be able to cook a meal be a nice person and hang a picture by the time they graduate elementary. And that's good with us. They've got like 30 acres, organic farm animals, and the kids are outside like through elementary. I mean, it's so cool. Another school, a uh, charter in Wisconsin outside Milwaukee, um, River Edge. And I have friends that relocated their family from California, actually from Napa Valley to Wisconsin, knowing no one to send their kids to this outdoor charter school that on 300 acres, kids are outside year round. I mean, it's negative five and they're like sending messages like send your kid to school with their hand warmers. So, I mean, there are some cool options, but they're few and far between. It's, it's really hard to find. Right. And they're for the privilege. They're not the norm. I mean, the cool thing about the River Edge one, it's free. It's a charter school. So it's not a private school, the one on 300 acres and they're expanding it. Um, but yes, I totally agree. I mean, if you're, if you can't, that's, not the norm. I mean, it's an, it's an anomaly, right? So I, if you, it is true where if you're privileged and you can afford a private tailored education, lucky you, but if not, the rest of these kids are stuck with anxiety and confidence issues at way too young of an age for nothing. It's just kind of right. crazy. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't make them better, more successful people at all. It does. It, we see that time and time again, the reason for success is not because you were pumped with all that pressure and anxiety, you know, at five or six. Um, I often, you know, it's kind of like my, like I say, it was my dissertation, but uh, it, I often fantasize about, yeah, about starting a movement um, of let's go back to basics with our education. Let's go back to developmental learning where children are immersed in an environment that intrigues them to learn rather than forces learning on them. Yeah. Because we're born natural learners. You know, a baby looks around. You don't have to say, look, look, look. Yeah. <laughs> Just looking, they're yeah. hearing, they're noticing, they're grabbing things, meaning that motivation is there from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah, we just have to keep it and not suck it out of them. Yeah, that's tough. Well, you let me know when you uh, when you move on that life goal of yours. I'll uh, pull some people together. <laughs> we should make that. I would love that, that education project happen. So, tell us what positive parenting is and how that differs from traditional parenting. This is something that is fairly big in your practice, I would say, or something you talk about kind of often. Mm -hmm. So, I think there is um, there is something called positive parenting. I don't know that. That's exactly what I talk okay. about, or I title my parenting as positive parenting, but I look at positive, meaning that I want to see what works. We often notice what doesn't work and we jump to fix what doesn't work, but I want to build on what does work. Where do things go right, what can actually um, feel good that we can remember. So for instance, a child with anxiety and a mom says to me um, something like, um, you know, this is for a 12 year old, let's say, or a 10 year old. And she says, you know, she actually does have some good days. And I go, bingo. 
You see, the fact that she has good days, meaning it means that we can build on that. It's kind of like not, well, look, you have good days. So how come you have bad days? It's look, you do have good days. Isn't that interesting? See how the change of intonation and the way in which I phrase something makes me pause and think, oh, I have good days. Interesting. So that goes, you know, and now I can maybe restore that. I can store this information and I can say to myself, yeah, I do have bad days. When I have a bad days, where did the good day go? Maybe it's still a memory. Can I relate? Can I reflect on that? Can I say, wow, I'm having a bad day? But I do know that it's not always like that. Because when I have a bad day, much like a small child, you never give me candy, right? The moment you don't give them candy feels like forever. Mm -hmm. And feels like they never. And I want to, and I don't want to argue that, yes, of course you get and so much and this, I want to make them aware. I never, wait, let's think about it. Yeah. Wait, you had candy yesterday. Yeah, but I want it now. I know, but you didn't have it yesterday. Maybe yeah. that means you will have it again. Maybe not now, but you will have it again. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Um, Because my little guy is really big right now. He'll say like, oh, I lost my... Pepe, that's like his, this panda he has forever. Like everything is forever. Whenever he's upset on something, I hurt my finger forever, or I can't find my book forever. And it, like my husband and I are always kind of like, we're not to him, but we're kind of laughing about this forever thing in the background. So that is really interesting insight of in their world, whatever emotion they're feeling, they really feel like is forever. It's forever. It takes yeah. over. But and that's what I said before, the emotion takes over and nothing else functions. And I want to recognize the child's emotion feels like forever, right? Yeah. But think when you think about it, is it really forever? Wait, I know you have really good memory. Remember when you did find it? Yeah. So you see, you tap into a whole other part, memory um executive functioning executive thinking process and so on retrieval of memory that builds this ability to not just be broken by what doesn't work but be able to build on what does work yeah i like that so and it's just, more yeah it's kind of positive parenting positive psychology also um drives on that yeah we can yeah. all see what doesn't work but what does work yeah no it's true i mean even in even with like employees i think sometimes like we don't need to work on like developing skills like people have a zone of genius like let them do what they're good at or what they want to do and you end up with such better results than trying to like train for other things that I don't know it's just not that there isn't a benefit to like lifelong learning and improvement don't get me wrong but I really think like sometimes for no reason we end up focusing on what could be improved instead of what's already going right and just doing more of what's already going right so I, I really like that right yeah so yeah. that's what positive in a way positive parenting it's not um always, um, you know, saying yes to everything, agreeing to everything, you agree to certain things, most of the time to the emotions, emotions are subjective, you accept them, you agree with them, you don't argue emotions, but you understand that it's not all just emotional, there are other parts to us, so you can use that, um, use that strength when I am feeling validated and understood that built strength in me and then I can use other skills and other tools I actually do have yeah no that's awesome what's your thoughts on discipline and how do you approach that so I think that most people when they use the word discipline when we say discipline everybody immediately thinks consequences punishments discipline is structure discipline is order in a way and, and order is not necessarily um, based on punishments, on rewards. 
um, and on learning through, you know, negative consequences, kind of like by conditioning. Um, so believe it or not, I don't believe in punishments, but I believe in structure and boundaries. So I don't say something like, if you do this one more time, then there is no um, whatever, right? Um, I just basically say, uh-uh, you cannot do this. You just can't, no. No doing this, whatever that is, jumping off of the kitchen counter, running into the street or, you know, not going to bed. We are doing this. This is the fact. But I can see you having a hard time with that, which, again, going back to I validate, I witness, I recognize. And then when a child feels that they don't actually have to fight as much. So I don't need to condition by saying something like. I will take a privilege or I will reward you when you have the right behavior. I basically help you recognize the, um, the difficulty of maybe having the right behavior because it's true, doing as I say, it is challenging. I recognize you struggle with it. You don't want to. And you see, by doing that, I respect the child. And then I don't have to use punishments and rewards. I just give respect, expect respect. So it's, you know, example is, if you don't go to bed right now, that's it. No play date tomorrow. And I now am sort of creating fear, intimidation, right? The child wants the reward, the play date, or whatever that is, or no, or screen. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. So they corrected themselves to gain an external reward, but they didn't really do the right thing for themselves. Mm -hmm. But what I do say instead is, you know, sweetie, if you don't go to bed now, you will be tired in the morning. And you will still have to get up. And that will be actually very difficult because when we're tired and we have to get up and still go to school, yeah, that's hard. So think about that. What is the right thing for you? Because you will still have to get up in the morning. See, the thing is, if you don't go to sleep, I will punish you. But if you don't go to sleep, actually, you will be punished naturally, right? That's the natural yeah. consequence. Being tired is no fun, but it doesn't excuse you from still doing what you're going to need to do. So think about it. I can tell you don't want to go to sleep right now, but you will have to get up in the morning. It's going to be so hard when you're tired. It's so much easier to get up when you had a good night's sleep. So I'm here to enforce that. But what is this enforcement is not to condition you by punishment or re reward, is to help you recognize what is really right for you. Yeah, yeah, I need to go to sleep. It's good for me. Yeah, helping more with the internal motivation versus the external consequences. I never used to do consequences with my three. Like we hadn't done any until he was like three. And then he's just been challenging and I have fallen into this trap of like, I, I try to make it related, but like, if you hit your brother again with that toy, I'm going to take the toy away or, but he responds so much more than when I'm like, you're not allowed to hit your brother. Then it's like, I get nothing. So I struggle. Um, I struggle without it. Yeah. yeah. The consequences are, it's more, it's easier for mom and dad. Like, I think it's, you get a more immediate reaction, but I, I, have wondered. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what right. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's not real change from within. It's not long lasting. It's as long as you are there. Right. And as soon as you're gone. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just saying uh, you can't hit your brother. No. But you see, you have to understand what is the bigger picture here? Why is he hitting you, his brother? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to ask, why are you hitting your brother? I actually kind of know you hit your brother for multiple reasons that are very common and natural to anybody. You're being territorial, jealous, 
He's annoying you because he's in your space. You are, you know, you actually don't know how to communicate anything other than this way and so on and so forth. So I understand all that. So I can say, whoa, no, no, no. I'm not going to let you hit your brother with this toy. You can use this toy. Yeah, you see, look at this toy right there. You have a toy, whatever that is. Yeah, what's it used for? It's a ball. It's a track. Yeah, it's not used to hitting for hitting anybody. You can use it. Now, you want to hit your brother. Hmm. You think you're angry, maybe jealous. You're going to use your words. So you can say, I'm angry right now. or I don't want you to play here. And you see, kids, I can, of course, when they're young, they can be a little rude. I'm not, <laughs> because that's just normal and natural. It's not always going to be like that. As they get older, you can say, you know, I need some space. I'm having a hard time right now. I need a break. So no matter what, you help them recognize what is triggering the action, the behavior, rather than just stopping the behavior. Yeah. yeah. Brings us back to the beginning. So instead of, if you hit your brother one more time, I'm going to take this toy is, whoa, uh-uh, this toy is not for hitting your brother. No. It's for something else. And actually, you know what it's for. So I'm going to help you put it down and use the toy the right way. And then you are having a hard time with your brother right now. It's okay. It's okay to have a hard time. You can use your words. You can say, and now I can help my child recognize what it is they're feeling. And rather than project it on someone else and make yeah. them the fault of it, um, be able to express it. Yeah, yeah I'm jealous. Sense. Yeah. And give them the tools because I mean, I want them to get along too. I think it's hard if you're playing cop all the time in the sibling situation, it's hard for them to learn like how to get along with people. So, yeah. Yeah, they also learn in a way that um, the parent is taking sides. And that's one of the one of the things actually that perpetuates sibling rivalry is yeah. parents taking sides. The more a parent to a child, you know, you think you're protecting your child from being hurt by his older brother, but actually to your other child, you're basically taking that child's side and you're right. always on your side. And to them, it only means one thing. Oh, you love them more. That's it. <laughs> they can't yeah they can't see the bigger picture here yeah so you love them more now imagine that what emotions that triggers in you if you think your parent loves your brother more than you like yeah ah. yeah and then they're really gonna hate their brother exactly <laughs> yeah. and then they're gonna do it again and again oh you love them more wait till you see what i can do yeah yeah the vicious cycle Yes. So yeah. this is why you want to not take sides. The object is used for something very particular, not for eating. It's very simple. Yeah. And I can enforce that. Uh-uh. I'm not going to let you use this to hit. No. But I understand that you want to hit. We're not going to hit, but we can use words. I don't like when you do that. See, that projects in a way the same emotion as the action that I was having, the behavior. But it still expresses how I feel and it allows me to communicate and connect without being aggressive. Yeah, I like that. Okay, switching gears a little bit. We talked about this, I, I have two things and then I have some rapid questions for you, but we've talked about this like rushing. What are your thoughts on like sleep training, potty training, all of these things we have to do allegedly as young parents of young kids right um so i i believe in sleep training and potty training i think there is sort of like a window of opportunity and again it's right for the child it's not that it's right for the parent so when is a baby able to regulate their feeding so they are eating enough during the day that they can sustain themselves at night so some people say at four months, at six months, 
right? And I think somewhere there, it really regulates. That is sort of the window of opportunity. People want to do it earlier. Um, you know, I only if they ask me, I tell them. But um, I do believe that it is possible to sleep train your child because it's right for them. It's that codependency, feeding on demand, the night sort of like the bottle, the nursing, the constant like, you know, switching between holding them, rocking them, putting them back, taking them to your, bat, to your bed, that disturbs them. So I think again about the good of the child, what is right for the child, what is right for the baby, they can handle being awake during the day and eating enough so they can sustain themselves at night. I don't want to disturb the night sleep. So I'm going to sleep train for them. Yeah. Because it's right. It's healthy. Um, potty training. Some parents wait. I'm going to wait until my child tells me. Well, they, you know, some kids do that at a very young age because they have siblings um, and they see that maybe at two um, but some kids don't. And then what happens is they are three, three and a half, and they're still not potty trained, but they are not um, toddlers anymore. They have a full language. They are at a stage of um, much more strength and power in terms of recognizing concepts and understanding and explaining things. They have initiative, like they are really at the forefront of ideas. So keeping them not potty trained is actually stopping them from full growth. So once again, I want to maybe potty train them according to their development. It fits right there. They're becoming more capable, more independent. I send them to school, right? And, um, and again, I don't know that maybe a two, it's a little too young. Some do show signs that they're capable of it, but I think it's three, maybe too late. Sometimes we're missing that opportunity and we're creating a little bit overindulgence yeah. in that kind of area. Yeah. Yeah. Boys may be a little later than the girls too, so I've heard, but what else is new? <laughs> People say that. Um, I don't know that it's 100% um, scientific. Yeah. Interesting. Just another little thing we put on the boys that maybe we don't need to. Okay. So for the, our, our well, I guess it starts probably pretty young, but what are your thoughts on screen time and how do you recommend handling that? Right. This is one of the biggest battles nowadays. I notice, you know, I, I look at babies six months, eight months old already. So like paying attention, I mean, and can tell the difference between a phone that's right there and just any other toy, like their eyes locked on that phone as soon as it lights up or whatever the screen. It's very interesting what it does to the young brain. We get very quickly addicted to it. There's no doubt. So I do believe in limiting screen time, but when you give screen time, because it's impossible to avoid it, give it wholeheartedly. I see parents are so stressed. Okay, but here, you can watch the show, but only half an hour and already there's a buildup of that tension. So the child is sitting there needing to enjoy, but constantly on edge, any minute's gonna be taken away from me. That builds so much more stress about that thing, that right, that shiny thing that's going to be taken away from me. So I say, whatever you decide, screen time, and it varies for age and also circumstances. Rainy Saturdays, snowy Saturdays, lockdown. I mean, I don't know. Like right? Mondays, I mean, yeah, totally. Yeah, car rides, long car rides, and so on. Sometimes I have other things to do. Learn to notice what else you are. Um, exposing your child to not just focusing on the screen. So yes, maybe there's a day with a little too much, then find a way to just detach from it by creating other types of activities, not no, no screen time. Yeah, no, no screen time today or now 
because we're going to do other things and there's plenty of other things to do. So focus on all these other puzzle pieces that are part of your child, outdoors, getting to being together, spending time together, even story time, bath time, dinner time. These are all important pieces of your child's life. Um, being at school, um, going to visit family and so on. All of these things, you don't have to constantly take them to Disneyland in order to take them away from screens. Right. You just have to remember that there's plenty of other things to do and focus on that. When you do give screen, let them enjoy it. Say, yeah. you're going to watch this one show and you know what? When you watch it, I want you to have a great time. And then when it's time to turn it off, no, yeah, we're going to turn it off. But you know what? You can tell me about it. Talk to me. Tell me, what did you see? What was the best part? And also, remember, you will have it again, right? So they can hold on to it rather than it feels, like, oh, it's taken away from me. And I now have to be obsessive or compulsive about it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Some rapid fire questions for you. Who is inspiring you these days? Could be anyone. But I'm curious who's inspiring you these days. Mm, that's a good question. These days, um, children, a lot of the young children and teenagers that I talk to, I can tell you, I am so inspired by their minds, by their thoughts, by their abilities. When we scratch the surface past the anxiety, past what the parents are putting on them, um, pass, I don't get what I want and all that. When we take a lot of that away and I'm able to do that, I find, you know, like amazing people underneath all that. And that's what I want. I want people to recognize, step back and enjoy this little person because they have so much. And especially parents of teenagers who are constantly, you know, everything that a teenager says, a parent argues and immediately tries to find a way, no, but this is life and this is the way. I said, listen to them. They're actually brilliant. We have, yeah. yes, we have, we need to teach them and they have a lot to learn, but we also can learn a lot from them. So yeah. I enjoy that. that. Okay. What's one um, thing parents could do to be more successful as parents? Uh, learn more about themselves, really recognize who they are, what triggers them, how their own past <laughs> constantly jumps ahead and navigates them in the present. So remember this, your children are not you. So you can't undo everything that was done to you through them. Your children are separate. You, you, they're separate from you. They're separate entities, but they're also living a separate life. So you had your parents, you had your triggers, you had um, whatever was done and not done. Work on that. Learn to recognize that. So you're not actually projecting all of it to your child and thinking that they have to live the life that you didn't. Um, see who they are, what works for them, what fits them. And in, you know, you have wounds, heal the wounds, you recognize your triggers, be mindful of them. Yeah. Um, I like I that. Think, yeah, that's good. I, I could work on that. I think we all could. Um, okay. Biggest mistake you made as a parent, like something you wish you would have done different. Um, it's, <laughs> It's hard, but there are times, you know, it can be small stuff, such as, did I spend enough time with each one? I think yeah. I should have separated them. I have three boys, they're yeah, yeah. close in age. They, they were very like-minded. So a lot of things, it was easy. They liked the same things. They were kind of, you know, um, connected to one another. But there are moments I think, hmm, should I have separated them a little bit and paid a little more attention to each one? I have moments like that for sure. Um, yeah, I love it. And you know, I'll never know, right? Because we can't right. go back to it. But I think that the siblinghood is important. Spending time together is great. And then maybe individual time. One, one is time. Yeah, so too. 
Yeah. yeah. A friend of mine, her parents growing up, they had four kids and every year on their birthday, they took whoever's birthday it was out. They took them out for dinner to a restaurant of their choosing just with the parents. So they, they got to go out with just the parents. And I was like, oh, that's so cute. I want to do that tradition in our family. Because like, you don't make, it's hard to make time when ours are close in age too. And I think you have older moms nowadays, if you're going to have more than one kid, like naturally, I think that gap is, is shortening between children. So that's a good, that's an interesting thing to be mindful of. Um, okay, my last question for you, I ask everyone this, but what's something about you that most people don't know? Um, what's something about me that most people don't know? Um, that I'm insecure or shy. I really? think most, yeah. I just would not take you as either of those things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. We're all insecure though. I mean, isn't that just the truth? I talk about that even with my boss at Craft. He's like, listen, you know, you think you don't know what you're doing. Like no one thinks they know what they're doing. Like that's <laughs> kind of just where we're at. So right. I appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate that honesty. Well, it was so amazing to chat with you. I learned a ton and um, I just really enjoyed meeting you, but I'm sure the audience will as well. Will you tell everyone where they can find you if they want to like learn more and you can tell us a little bit about, I know you have like some courses that you're offering and all those fun things. So fill everyone in. Sure. So um, Dr. C also on social media, it's Dr. Siggy on Instagram. There is uh, daily tips and tools, the clips, the videos, a lot of information there where people can tap into. It's on TikTok as well. Um, sorry, that's my dog. Oh, okay. um, um, and um, I have a an, uh, Facebook and the website, um, drsiggy.com, where there's a lot of um, downloadable information, a lot of also free stuff that people can look at. And there is a course for uh, parents of toddlers that they can purchase. They can purchase the whole course. They can purchase just parts of it, like sleep training or, um, you know, tantrums, uh, party training. So they can purchase just that section, uh, very reasonably priced. They also can, through this, uh, the course that they purchase, they look, they can learn my approach, my philosophy. Um, it's all very practical. There's a lot of tools and, um, and tips there that you can use for children of all ages. Uh, working on the next course so hopefully in a few months we'll have the course for the next age with the same kind of um information where people of three to six year olds um what are the challenges and what they struggle with fabulous well thank you so much it was wonderful to meet you thank you thank you so much i appreciate it as well